So this clip we're covering brain mechanisms involved in learning and if you're a bit rusty on the structure of a neuron I suggest you check out my clip structure of a neuron on this channel particularly in relation to what we mean by synapse, neurotransmitter, pre and post synaptic neuron etc. Now there's over a hundred different types of neurotransmitters the most important neurotransmitter involved in learning is glutamate, which is the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system. Excitatory as opposed to inhibitory, and we'll learn more about those when we get to mental health. What we mean by excitatory effect is that it's more likely to stimulate a nerve impulse in another neuron. So glutamate plays a key role in long-term potentiation it's highly concentrated in the hippocampus and the amygdala it's stored in the vesicles of the presynaptic neuron and when an action potential is generated these glutamate neurotransmitters are released into the synapse and they will bind with specialized receptors on the postsynaptic neuron particularly NMDA so the abbreviation is acceptable. NMDA plays a vital role in conjunction with glutamate in learning and enabling LTP. It's found on the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron which enables the glutamate to bind with it and establish memory and learning. Now there's a couple of variations of the Morris water maze experiment but just briefly the water maze consisted of a pool that was about 60 centimetres deep. There were a few objects that could be used as reference points. And the only way the mice could escape was by finding a platform that was a couple of centimetres um, below the surface that they had to find and climb up. Now, in one such variation of the experiment, the experimental group of mice had their NMDA receptors blocked. And through repeated trialling, they basically showed no improvement in their ability to escape the water maze. They were unable to form a spatial memory and develop that long-term potentiation as opposed to a control group that had no tampering with their NMDA receptors and they progressively became quicker at escaping the maze and developing that spatial learning. Another study, Tissen, performed was by modifying the NMDA receptors of a group of mice and they were able to learn tasks more efficiently than a control group who didn't have their NMDA receptors modified. Let's look at four brain structures involved in learning. We'll start with the hippocampus which is as we remember from unit 3 is largely responsible for long-term potentiation, the consolidation of short-term to long-term memories, specifically declarative memories. It's involved in spatial learning and navigation. Evidence of this? Well, MRIs conducted on experienced London um, cab drivers who are not only good on their spatial navigation in terms of learning the best way to get from point A to point B, but also working out shortcuts. So MRIs show that these people have a larger right hippocampus area as opposed to the rest of us. And along with the thalamus and the amygdala, it's responsible for initiating and processing the fear response. In a variation of the Morris water maze experiment, there were mice who had their hippocampuses removed and they again were unable to show improvement in the water maze performance, i.e. they were unable to establish long-term potentiation and they basically repeated the same errors they made repeatedly when exposed to the water maze experiment as opposed to a control group with intact hippocampus who were progressively improving in terms of the time taken to escape the maze and a reduction in the number of errors. So in terms of what you need to know about the amygdala's role in learning, two things really. It mediates the emotional aspects of an episodic memory so basically it's responsible for our emotional learning as well as fear conditioning when exposed to a phobic 
stimulus or an anxiety producing stimulus. More about that when we get to classical conditioning later in the course. The thalamus also involved in initiating and processing the fear response when exposed to the phobic stimulus and also to a degree plays a role in spatial learning. When you think about the cerebellum's role in learning, think motor. It doesn't initiate a motor response, we know that the frontal lobe does that, but it is involved in the motor learning in terms of making the fine adjustments to movements. So for instance, let's say you're observing your tennis coach show you how to drill a backhand down the line. It's your cerebellum that enables you to observe the sequence of movements required and imagine yourself executing that backhand. The cerebellum is also involved in triggering conditioned motor responses such as an eye blink in response to a tone after repeated so association with say a puff of air and a tone. More about that when you get to classical conditioning. Next week I'll be covering plasticity of the brain so stay tuned.